I'm Steven Anderson, and this is As I See It. Now, <clears throat> I've just uploaded a video uh, regarding this book, this A Wesleyan Holiness Theology by J. Kenneth Grider, a Nazarene, now deceased. You can't teach anymore, thank God. Uh, <clears throat> there's a reason for that I'm, I said that. And I pointed out a little bit about his, uh, that I, the heresy that was, I just discovered by opening this book randomly the other day. And seeing, you know, first of all, his doctrine of God's absurd, that God's love and God's righteousness are not part of God's very nature, but only something God chooses to do. Out of what? Out of what does he choose if it's not righteousness and love? What motivates God to choose anything? That's absurd. That, that is the ultimate in free will heresy, where, where not even your nature, you know, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, God, God is not by nature just. You better hope he is, because otherwise he can just randomly change his mind because he doesn't like you. Or God is not love. In other words, he can simply annul the cross. I mean, how do they allow such a blatant, in-your-face heretic to teach for decades? Decades and decades. Was there no Nazarene student that had enough biblical knowledge to stand up and said, You're a heretic, professor? Apparently not. Although such a student would be immediately canceled. I never would have survived. Thank God he didn't have me go to seminary. I'd never. Somebody would not have survived. It would either be me or the seminary. Because it would have been the Word of God that was the arbiter. All right, so I want to continue on with what I began on Wesley's, or not Wesley's. Wes, Wesley, let me make it clear here. Wesley's view of the atonement was substitutionary atonement, penal substitutionary atonement. Wesley, he was he had he was an Anglican priest. He held to Anglican doctrine while he had his holiness stuff on the side. So he had his Methodist um, classes, his cell groups, as we'd say today while inside the Anglican Church, while he was also uh, trying to proclaim Orthodox Anglicanism, like infant baptismal regeneration and things like that. So he, Wesley is very confusing, especially to John Wesley, So uh, and to those around him. Uh, you know, the, the kind of biographies you buy at a bookstore, a Christian bookstore, or order online now, generally are not ones that really look at the person honestly. They tend to gloss over everything. And, you know, heroes of the faith. we got to have our heroes. Well, no, no. A Luther is not the kind of guy you want to worship. John Wesley's not the kind of God you want to worship. Guy you want to worship. Calvin, you don't want to worship Calvin. You don't want to worship Billy Graham. None of them. Don't worship me. You'll be worshiping a false god. So worship Christ and Christ alone. God. All right. So, but I want to go on as far as Wesley or uh, Griders and apparently the Nazarenes error. I don't. I I have the. Some things about the Nazarenes are not hard and fast. Like, they permit both infant baptism and believer's baptism. It's up to the parents. Um, and I would think on theories of the atonement, 
what they do say in the in the Nazarene handbook is Christ suffered for us. Now that points to what Greider says. But it is loose enough that you could probably get away. I don't think they really care. They're not really concerned about the cross. The, Naz, the, whole, the whole holiness movement and Wesley was not particularly concerned about the cross. They were concerned about personal holiness. So it's sort of like uh, pietism taken to the to the to the crash and burn stage. When you push anything too far, like, like sanctification. Sanctification, first of all, the word sanctification means holiness. That's all it is, it's holiness. And what it means to something is holy, not because of the intrinsic character of the thing itself, but because of who it belongs to. Let me point that out. We are holy. Everybody that belongs to Christ is holy because we have been set apart by God unto himself for his purposes as his people. We are holy because of that. And Christ, and just like the Old Testament temple, you go back and when they built the temple and, and all the articles that went in the temple, they all had to be cleansed, usually sprinkled with blood to cleanse him, to make them acceptable to God. It was his house. He didn't want dirt coming in his house. So uh, we're going to look at uh, what Greider says here, or I'm going to look at it and try to read it to you. Uh, if there's, if somebody, if it's, you know, I can, I can't remember how much this book cost. It wasn't terribly cheap. Should I look it up right now? I mean, uh, Amazon. What's the... Beacon Hill Press. Let me look up that too while I, while I do it. Uh, let me go. What's the, what's the number here? Uh, nine, seven, eight, dash zero dash. ISBN number eight three four one. Nine seven eight dash zero dash eight three four one dash one five one two dash two. I can't remember exactly how those number groups break down. No. What don't they? D ISBN. Boy, Amazon is stupid. No, that doesn't get it right either. Okay, I guess I'll have to use the title because Amazon is too too dumb to understand an I uh, an ISBN number. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Usually, you can just type them in and you'll get the thing. A Wesleyan holy. Uh, J. Gen I'll, I'll just do uh, uh, J. Kenneth uh, Grider. Okay, I want to show you the book. Okay, here it is. Okay, it's sixty bucks. Kindle is twenty nine ninety nine. Uh, and if there's sufficient requests, I suppose I could. Uh, um, actually go into this section in more detail and put it up on the screen. I don't like doing that too much. You know how YouTube is. <laughs> and copyright. Okay, so it's it's uh, 60 bucks for a hard copy. Let me show you on the screen. Uh, okay, this is the current Amazon page. Uh, I don't know where else you'd get it, actually, either than Amazon. Uh, Christianbooks.com might have it, but this is, you know, trying to find anything on... Uh, the holiness movement is not about theology. 
This is the only thing I know of. Uh, I think there's maybe a, a, a tiny, it's not like Calvinism. You can get shelves full of theology books on Calvinism. Um, okay, they got some used ones for from $20 on up. Five new from 50 bucks. So, you know, Amazon, even if you got free delivery because you're a member, they still tr they, they just add the shipping onto the price, you know, and call it free. You ever notice companies do that? So, this is the book here. Uh, in case you want to check it out for yourself, uh, if if you are a Nazarene, I highly recommend you at least get the Kindle version. Or you should actually have this on your shelf. Because I want you to know what you're into. You know, if you're a Catholic, you better have a copy of the Catholic Catechism, even though it's probably out of date since Francis keeps changing the Word of God and the Ten, and the, and the Ten Commandments and the, the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Whatever else he changes is like <laughs> the sacraments. <sighs> hmm, that's the judgment of God right there, Francis. Anyway, this is a hard cover. I don't see a soft cover. There's a collectible for 1995. But this is uh let's See what do they have for an ISBN number? Uh the 13 digit is 978-0834115125. There. It's 592 pages. Some some tree gave its life for this thing. Well, actually, you could probably get more than one book out of a tree. Anyway, uh, this is important, especially for anybody that's in the holiness movement, Methodists. Any any church that is uh, that has any connection to a, a system of, uh, of atonement that is uh, related to the governmental model. Uh, Finney, Charles Finney, and many of his followers, or as many of the, you know, these. It's, it, and besides, he has, he goes through theories of atonement, the ransom model, ransom paid to Satan, that's ridiculous. Thieves, murderers, and liars, you don't pay ransoms to. He had no right. The devil's got no rights. Uh, the satisfaction theory. Problem with that is it satisfies the wrong thing. The moral influence theory. That talk about weak. Um, then you have the punishment theory. What Grider calls the penal substitutionary atonement. Biblical evidence. It it is the biblical revelation of the cross. Uh, but he degrades it. He he denies it. Uh, absolutely denies it. Uh, he he goes actually goes into that more than the others, and uh, and what it why it's no good. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna go through. I want to go through that, and I want to go through uh, the Grotius governmental theory. Uh, <clears throat> see how much time we got. It might take more than one video to go through these two. But this is very important because the cross is Christianity. That's it. Christ and Christ crucified. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're on your own. You're on your own. You'll stand before God naked in your sins. You have no atonement. It's just like, just like Jehovah's Witnesses. If you want to deal with the Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to your door, very simple. Very simple. And do it with a tear, please. Look in the eye and say, what will you do before the judgment seat of Christ with your sins? What will you do with your sins? How will you enter God's kingdom in your sinful state? They have no atonement. They don't believe in the atonement at all. They believe, if, I, if they haven't changed it again, that Jesus died for the sin of Adam. 
and that alone. It's, I guess it's like a lot like Church of Christ. Because they don't really have an atonement either. And practical Christianity, including what I was raised in as, as a Lutheran, does not have a consistent understanding of the atonement, even though you Lutherans, some Lutherans are pretty good. I can name one church that I, local church here, it's the only local church I'm aware of that consistently preaches Christ and him crucified and Christ our justification. I got some other problems, but that, that, I can only vouch for what I've heard from that one preacher and had an opportunity to, to talk to him a bit and scold him for having close communion. He's not responsible for that. It's a denominational thing. But yeah, uh, if, <laughs> that's the only church I'm aware of. That's the only church I've ever visited where, uh, that I can remember at least, where Christ is consistently put in the foreground. Most Baptist churches love to preach out of the Old Testament. I don't understand that. The ones that should be the most biblical are sometimes the weakest. The, the, the gospel is like an add-on. Anyway, so I want to look at the uh, at the what what he calls the uh, the punishment theory of the atonement, uh, otherwise known as the penal substitutionary atonement. In other words, Christ took our punishment upon Himself. And see what Greider says about this. Now, this is not just Calvinism. This is Lutheranism and really Roman Catholicism. But they're just not consistent about it because of the stuff that have been lay layered over the top, like penance and everything else, uh, <clears throat> that they've managed to, to get works added on. But the, the, the underlying thing in the Roman Catholic Church, the central rite, the central sacrament that occurs at every Mass is... The mass, the remembrance, the the re uh, the of of the re uh, the display, the representation to use their language of Christ's crucifixion, because that's what the bread and wine is about. Do this in remembrance of me, his death. You you show forth my death until I come again. So let's start with the quote unquote punishment theory here. <clears throat> this is the view of Calvin and Calvinism. Not true. It's a review, the, the, the view of Protestantism. Now, I have to say, the, the only um, um, Anabaptist that was able to write much was uh, Menno Simons, because all the others got killed. Um... Uh, but the Anabaptist movement today, the Mennonites and the Amish, pretty much. Uh, there, there's also some Dunker Baptists and everything else in there, uh, small groups. That uh, They tend to be strong on discipleship and following the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. But they tend to be very weak on the gospel, on uh, the atonement. Now, I haven't read Menno Simons in a long time. He was very strong on you must be born again. Uh, I have to go back and review his writings in order, but it's not really relevant unless I'm talking to Mennonites and, and Amish, I guess. So, uh, <clears throat> Because nobody else knows what they believe anyway. Uh, but but I, uh, th that, was, um, that was what's called a part of the Radical Reformation. But the, the Magisterial Re Reformation, the, the state church is what it produced, was the Lutherans and the Calvin and, the, and Zwingli, the, those reformers. Uh, and all of them held to substitutionary atonement because that's really what Rome taught, too. It's just, like I said, been layered over with a bunch of muck. If you took the fire hose to it and washed all the mud off it, you'd end up with the, subst with the substitutionary atonement. That's what's celebrated on the, on the altar 
with the bread and the wine. It's Christ dying for our sins. But so, yeah, see, Grider is careless, and he does not understand the scriptures well at all. It's like, this this guy was a professor of theology? I mean, I've, I've never read, uh, read a, a book on theology as careless and as sloppy as Grider. Certainly he doesn't measure up to, say, Bavink. Bavink, you know. Yeah, or, or now Turretin, I don't know. That That's just a verbal warfare there. Um, strong, you know. No, this, this, no. Uh, no, this guy doesn't rate a um, two-year degree in theology. He doesn't, you have to understand the scriptures, and to understand the scriptures, you have to know Christ. And it doesn't come overnight. I mean, I've, I've been studying the scriptures as a born-again believer, a disciple of Jesus, his possession, for 46 years. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bad servant, but <laughs> I'm still his servant. I belong to him. So here, let's le- read what, uh, in fact, the very title that called the punishment theory, isn't that sort of hostile? You, 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 can, get the, you can feel the hostility of Grider toward, toward biblical the, the biblical atonement right there. The punishment theory. This is a view of Calvin and Calvinism. And like I said, what about Lutheranism? See, obviously somebody has a particular bias against Calvinism. Well, I understand Calvinism better than most Calvinists. I understand where the core of the problem is. It's the exhaustive eternal decree of all things. But that is, you can't justify that from the scripture at all. But their view of the atonement is not a problem, okay? Other than the the limited atonement, it's sort of a quantitative atonement rather than a. Uh, see, what did Christ die to satisfy? That's where they get they get off. But so does everybody else. I, I will share my idea. And you can reject it or not. I just, after 46 years, oh, I think that's what... Hopefully, you know, the Scripture says that, that they shall all be taught of God, by God. Uh, so that's uh, um, not taught about God, but taught by God. It's a genitive of means there. So uh, maybe you'll find my view helpful. It's like it's sort of like click. and say, Oh, that makes sense. Maybe it makes sense to you, too. So this is the view of Calvin and Calvinism. Well, it is the view of Calvin and Calvinism, but not only them. Uh, By his death on the cross, took the punishment for our sins. Yeah, that's sort of the biblical view, isn't it? Uh, John Calvin himself taught that Christ took the punishment for the sins of everyone. Well, that's debatable. Uh, There's still controversy about that. (laughs) <laughs> he wasn't totally clear. Uh, and when you look in Calvin's Institutes or Calvin's Commentaries, which is you know a huge set uh, that I do not have on paper, that di- a whole tree would have had to die for that. Um, Calvin might say one thing one place and another thing someplace else too. So we are inconsistent people. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not really hostile toward Calvin. I'm hostile to toward the the uh, the doctrine of uh, the, the doctrines that really come from from Aristotle through Augustine that Calvin picks up and maybe amplifies slightly. The the eternal decree of all things. Now there definitely is election in the scripture. I'm not going to so what the thing is, but does the Bible clearly teach it? If it's something you can't avoid because it keeps showing up in the scriptures, then you can't avoid it. But uh, <clears throat> Calvin, where Calvin's wrong is where he carries things too far. It doesn't mean that there's not some underlying basis there. 
<clears throat> because what what bothers me about Calvin's uh, well, Luther was even more predestinarian than Calvin, at least at times. <laughs> but what side of the bed did he wake up on? Yeah, Luther was was not terribly inconsistent. Neither was Cal Calvin. I think attracts people because he, there's a certain consistency to him, uh, logical consistency. But that doesn't mean he's right. You can have things that are logical and consistent that are wrong. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Calvin and Calvin, is, but not only them, that, that by his death on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins. Duh, didn't you learn that in Sunday school? Doesn't everybody teach that? If you're in a church that doesn't teach that, I mean, you couldn't find a real Calvinist. Well, I shouldn't say that. You'd have a tough time finding a Calvinist church where I live. You have, well, you certainly wouldn't go to a PCUSA church where is, there is one of those here. They're not Calvinist. They're apostate. It's like the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. It's neither evangelical nor Lutheran nor a church. But it certainly fits into American culture today. I'm tempted to flash a picture of a certain female preacherette they have that usually wears leather and is covered with tattoos. Looks like she came off a motorcycle. Can't remember her name. Sort of a celebrity, though. So back to the subject here. Uh, Calvin himself taught that Christ took the punishment for the sins of everyone. Well, there's the debate about what Calvin taught on that. <clears throat> it's not something that he really went into. It wasn't an issue. It wasn't an issue. It only became an issue later when some people tried to thought Calvin wasn't logical enough. <clears throat> Although this was inconsistent with his understanding that Christ's death is unconditional in his benefits to those God uh, predestined to be saved. Not really. That's why it got altered, though. Theodore Besa, Calvin's son-in-law, was his mother the Anabaptist whose husband died in Calvin's well, Geneva's prison. I shouldn't say Calvin's prison. It belonged to, didn't belong to Calvin. I don't know. Uh, and later Calvinists generally corrected Calvin at this point, teaching that Christ took the punishment of only the elect, dying only for them and not for everyone. Now... Where is it? Uh, okay. The one that makes it... I shouldn't be talking away from the microphone, should I? The book, A Death of the, the Death of Death and the Death of Christ by the Baptist, uh, which I can't see right at the moment here. Somebody's got too many books, and they're not orderly. Uh, they get spread around. It should be here. Anyway, that that's a polemic for limited atonement. So if you want to find out uh, the polemical arguments by Calvinists. <clears throat> that book is one. But it's, uh, it's polemical. It's not biblical. Uh, and the, the problem is that in that book, too, you find out the idea of atonement as quantitative. That Christ could die for a certain amount of sins. Rather than just for sin in general. See, that goes back to Rome. The idea of, of, you know, like making penance. You know, sin, 
you see, it's it's the question questions about sins, the punishment due to sins, rather than the punishment that do just due to the sinner. Which is, you know, it, it's an error. It just doesn't work with Scripture. Uh, and that, that's where the limited atonement comes from, really. And another problem is that in, with some Calvinists, the idea is that the, because Christ is, it's, it's, your salvation is based on predestination in Calvinism rather than faith in Christ. And uh, it just doesn't make sense to them that Christ would die for those that he didn't predestine to salvation just their logic. It doesn't work scripturally, but because Christ, the Bible says that Christ died for the sins of all men. And that's what it actually says. It doesn't say all kinds of men. It says all men. Uh, <clears throat> that's what the Greek says. Now see, see right off the top, Grider is making a really serious error. He's equating penal substitutionary atonement to Calvinism. And he continues to do that all the way through. Is, is that called spoiling or poisoning the well or, or what? Because you do not have, most people that believe in, in that Christ died for your sins, which is substitutionary atonement, that he took the penalty of death for you aren't Calvinists. It has no real connection to Calvinism except in Grider's mind. Or he's just using that as a device, consciously or unconsciously, to, to keep people away from the truth. Because it's not necessarily related to Calvinism at all. It's just, it'd be like arguing that that the Trinity is false doctrine because Calvinists hold it, and Rome holds it, and so do all Christians. <laughs> you know, because you, you can't well because they believe that. It's like saying uh, because Rome believes in the doctrine of the Trinity, therefore it must be wrong. You're Roman Catholic because you believe in the Trinity, really. No, you're a Christian. Okay. <clears throat> so limited atonement is not related necessarily at all to penal substitutionary atonement. In other words, Christ took our punishment. The wages of sin is death, right? Christ, the sinless one, died for us in our place. Not what the scripture teaches? You don't believe that? You're not a Christian. You're still in your sins. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, or the, or the great right throne judgment, let's be accurate here, in your sinfulness. Because you're not trusting in Christ. You've got no Savior. Without that, what, 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 did, what saves you? You've got no offering for your sin. No covering for your nakedness. No blood of Christ to cleanse you. That's why the fact that this longtime professor, this is his magnum opus here, in the Nazarenes <clears throat> holds this position. It's like I find it incredulous. And if Nazarenes believe this, they're damned. They are. They haven't believed on Christ. They're trusting in their own sinless perfection, maybe. Hmm. Why would you even worry about the doctrine of entire sanctification? It occurs when Christ returns. Why, why would you even you, uh, promote a movement to further that doctrine? if you realize that Christ paid for all your sins. 
I think that's what Luther meant when he uh, wrote to a letter to Melanchthon in instructing him to sin boldly. Your sins are covered. Don't make a big deal out of it. I think is what his point was. Don't be obsessed with it because it's already been paid for on the cross 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago then. I think that was his point. <laughs> Not that he was actually seeking for more sin. I don't think Luther was saying, uh, uh, let us sin that grace, let us sin abound that grace might abound or something like that. No, that wasn't his point. I don't think so. Whereas in the satisfaction theory, it is God's honor that is satisfied. That was an earlier theory. And else, Anselm, Anselm or something like that, put it out. Um, uh, Anselm in his uh, Cur Dios Humo, Humo um, had to do with the feudal system, projecting society into the Bible. Uh, no, satisfying the, the, the honor of God. In this view, God's justice will not allow him the, penal, the substitution, the punishment, penal substitution, to forgive sin without being fully punished. Yeah, the law must be satisfied. God's law must be satisfied. God said it. He said the wages of sin is death. He said the soul that sins shall die. He told Adam the day you eat of that tree, you will die. Yeah. God can't lie. He can't break his word. God upholds his word. He can't do otherwise and remain to be God. God cannot lie. He would have known himself. Well, that'd be a mess. Just like the devil can't tell the truth. The satisfaction of Christ's death is God's justice. Yeah, what's satisfied is God's justice. The justice in the law. Let me make that point. The law, the law must be satisfied. God's law, beginning with the law given to Adam. God's law must be satisfied. Otherwise, you're still... First, let's remember this. You know, in the first part of the New Testament, the church is all what? Jews. Under the law. Why was Christ born under the law? Why was Christ subject to the law? Why did Christ have to keep the law, which some say he didn't? If Christ didn't keep the commandments, you're in your sins, and Christ is still in the grave. He had to be the spotless Lamb of God. And if you don't believe that, you're a pagan. You don't believe in not the Christ of the Bible. Not the Christ that rose from the dead. In this view, God's justice will not allow him to forgive uh, without sin being fully punished. Yes! God must fulfill his law. How do you forgive sinners when the law is there? Your own law. Can a king simply ab abrogate his own law? Then it's not law. And God's law is God's word. If God annuls his own commands, what kind of God is he? What kind of Lord is he? The law must be satisfied. Jesus was born under the law. He kept the law. He died under the law. 
an innocent man that he might satisfy the, the demands of the law that sinners must die and be cut off from God's people. The law must be satisfied. That's the barrier. How can God be just given the law that he gave in Christ, because Christ is the word of God, and simply ignore what he said? What does the scripture say? that he might be both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. God had to satisfy the law, which he had sometimes overlooked, like in the case of David. David under the law should have been, David and Bathsheba should have been both put to death for their adultery not even looking into the murder of her husband to cover up David's David's murder of arranged for the murder of her husband by the hands of the enemy like God doesn't know what's going on there in order to cover up his sin How did God let that slide? Well, he, David didn't get away scot free. Why did the son of, of, of pregnant Bathsheba die? Those are the sins of David. David's kingdom was never the same. David's rule was never the same after that. But still, both of them should have been put to death. They should have been stoned to death under the law. As David says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What did God do? God looked forward to the cross. But what about the angels? They're looking on and saying, what the heck is going on here? How come God didn't have him put to death and raise up a new king? How come God has let all these sins pass, more or less? Instead of having swift justice. What's going on here? God had to vindicate his righteousness his justice on the cross as Paul says in Romans is it chapter 3 I, I'm sorry I get carried away preaching I, I don't get the opportunity to preach Christ and Christ crucified I can get the opportunity to preach. Maybe there's a reason why. I don't know. If they were to ask me to substitute preach there, there I, I would just preach the gospel, knowing that they probably don't know what it is. Yikes. Or I'd ask them, do you people know what the gospel is? Because I noticed when I, when I preached the gospel there before, that I, I, I noticed an awful lot of people that had sort of scowls on their face. They're like, what's this? this was, my question was coming up in my mind. It's, why do I see these people with those expressions on their face? Like, they haven't heard this before. <laughs> Maybe it's my imagination. Now, I'm concerned. Why I'm doing this is because I'm concerned about Nazarenes and all Christians. Do you actually know what the gospel is? Do you believe the gospel? The real gospel? Yeah, in this view, God's justice will not allow him to forgive sin 
without being fully punished. Yes! Yes! Kreider denies that. And it was fully punished when the sinless God-man died on the cross for those whom God had previously predestined unconditionally to be saved eternally. See, here, Grider is poisoning the well, you know, the debating trick, by mixing Calvinism in with the substitutionary atonement. Poisoning the substitutionary atonement, which is not necessarily Calvinist at all, for example, the Lutherans, the Orthodox Lutherans, Luther, that, that's, that's dirty pool. They'd be like, you know, referencing something that Jehovah's Witnesses believe or the, or the Mormons believe and saying, yeah, they, they, they hold that doctrine. And it's really not, it's not because of what they are. It's just incidental. The, the fact that Calvinists believe this, it's like only Calvinists believe this. That's a lie. Grider is, well, this is a dirty dog trick, really. Or he just has no idea what he's doing. That's probably the best thing I could say about him. He's an ignorant man. But since he was a professor of theology for decades... And even went to uh, to England to study, I believe. Let me make a little excursion back here. It says here, Dr. Grider holds the distinction of having served at a fa as, a, as a faculty member at Nazarene Theological Seminary longer than any other professor, 38 years. He taught at many places. Um... Uh, as well, about the author, it's got two pages of accolades for him. Holds an MA, uh, an MDiv, um, summa cum laude from Drew University, a, a BD, 1947, from Nazarene Theological Seminary, a THB. What's a THB? Oh, uh, Not sure. A, uh, um, an AB and DD from Nazarene, uh, Olivet Nazarene, Nazarene University, which used to be just down the road about 30 miles from here, I think. <clears throat> A lot of Nazarene churches in this area. Uh, authored uh, a number of books, commentary on Ezekiel, commentary on Zechariah, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Beacon Hill Press. I think that's the Nazarene Publishing House. Uh, okay. He lectured at several colleges and presented papers at national and sectional meetings. So he's... Uh, I think he also uh, studied in England. At one point. University over there. <clears throat> anyway, so saying he's ignorant is probably not. Saying he doesn't understand the Bible, yeah, obviously. Obviously, I can say that. Because understanding the, the Bible is not a matter of, of how much you study. It's under whose tutelage you study. If it's under God's tutelage. See, if you know the author, he'll lead you into what he meant. If you seek that, if you seek to really know and understand, so I mean, it's something you can understand. <clears throat> where where was I here? Okay, so he, mix, he mixes it in with limited atonement and predestination. That's not related to the doctrine of the atonement at all. They're not necessarily connected. <clears throat> Several significant problems attend the punishment theory. Now, Calvinists and Lutherans do not refer to it as the punishment theory. <clears throat> Why does he use that expression? 
Because he's being a dirty dog. One is that like the satisfaction theory, God's honor had to be satisfied, it denies actual forgiveness. Now, I find this absurd. If God's justice must be and is satisfied by punishment, then no forgiveness is possible. You want to hear something stupid? Pay attention. So if if the law has to be satisfied, then there's no actual forgiveness. In other words, God's not setting aside his word and just annulling his commandment and saying, it's okay. God can't do that. So uh, apparently forgiveness uh, with Grider is like love with Grider and righteousness with Grider is simply what God arbitrarily chooses to do when he wishes. I think I think he has an idea of God's sovereignty that's much higher than Calvin's. God can do whatever the heck he wants. He can lie if he wants. <clears throat> no. How can he both be just and justify sinners? That's the question. How can you do this if it's simply an arbitrary forgiveness? Oh, I, as the king, absolve you of your crimes against me. Because I choose to. And everybody else in the kingdom looks on and says, uh, why don't I get the same treatment? <laughs> it is either punishment or forgiveness. Surely not punishment and forgiveness. Now listen, listen to Greider's argument. See if he's missing something here. If a father were to punish his son with a whipping, he could not uh, then say, now, son, I forgive you. <coughs> yeah, well, actually, you could. Was he this guy ever a father? Because of... First of all, it's the purpose of punishment. Okay, so... <clears throat> if I were to give my son a whipping, which I don't think I'd do now, he might turn around and give me a whipping. Uh, but... Uh, First of all, the whipping is not the same. It's not really. It's that's uh, discipline. <coughs> but then, see, uh, there's no way a whipping could necessarily atone for what my son did. The the, the whipping is a a corporal uh, discipline that is to uh give your child the idea that it is uh, that certain behaviors will result in bad things it doesn't necessarily meet uh the uh, it's not it's not actually a uh paying the penalty we're talking about god's law and the penalty for god's law uh, breaking god's law is what death death the wages of sin is death the law demands death <laughs> He that does not abide in all these commandments, keep all these commandments, the wages of sin is death. That soul shall die. Uh, so, oh, this guy is so weird. If a father were to punish his son with, uh, with a whipping, he could not then say, now, son, I forgive you. Yes, you could. Because the whipping will not atone for the wrong. Breaking the commandment of God to honor your father and mother. This man is, is so spiritually dumb. It, it, it's, I, if a father were to say that, the son would uh, see through it right away. First of all, when you give your son a weapon, it's not for the purpose of punishment commensurate with what they did. 
It's for educational purposes. Lest they grow up and go to prison or the gallows. It'd be good if they still had gallows. No, you did not forgive me. You punished me. So the grider is not going to scripture, is he? So what is the what what kind of offenses are we guilty of? Violating God's law, and we know what the punishment is: death. Grider doesn't take sin seriously. Well, you can't. If you're in the holiness movement, you can't take seri sin seriously. Wesley neutered the doctrine of sin. He made it equivalent to what Catholics would often call mortal sin. In other words, in fact, you, you had to do something fully aware of what you're doing in full possession, possession of free will. Fully aware of the consequences. Uh, fully in control of yourself. Well, sinners are never in that position. Saints are never in that position. So you can say, oh, that's not sin. That's just shortcoming. But if you're going to have, have uh, something you define as uh, uh, sinless perfection, you have to have pretty, a pretty weak view of sin. If you look at the biblical point of view, that the commandments are all summed up in two, or all hang on two, really, to use Jesus' words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at those carefully and tell me you are entirely sanctified and the flesh has been wiped out in your body. You no longer have flesh. Sin no longer dwells in you. If you believe that, well, I have a bridge to sell you that I don't actually own. See, when people resort to, to telling stories like Greider just did here, you know there's something wrong. Another problem with the theory is that it throws God inf God's infinite goodness into question. How so? See, we've already seen yesterday when I pointed out that Greider re got rid of righteousness as part of God's nature and love as part of God's nature. So God isn't by nature does it love nor is he righteous by nature. Do you, do you really want to, to, to have dealings with that God then? So how is he, uh, how is he consistent then? How do you know he's going to be consistent? How do you know if he tells you one thing today, he's not going to change his mind tomorrow? How do you know if he's not, that he's not going to treat you unjustly because it pleases him? You don't, or decide not to love you because it pleases him not to. Because love isn't part of his nature. Yikes! Like I said, this man, the fact that, what was it, 38 years teaching as a professor in Nazarene seminaries, and he got away with this stuff? It shows you much, so much about the, the spiritual discernment of the Nazarenes. Numb skulls. You know, your brain is numb. doesn't work anymore. Well, if you're going around claiming you're sinlessly perfect, it's more like God's judgment on you because you're denying the Scripture. John says, if anyone says he has no sin, he deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. Now, Grider believes in sinless perfection, in entire sanctification, in the second work of grace.
based on scriptures that say nothing of the kind. Well, they do talk about sinless perfection. At the return of Christ. I don't know why they can't read the second half of the verse. So it throws God's infinite, what is infinite goodness anyway? Just other than not quantifiable. That's all it means. Infinite. Finite is measurable. Infinite is not measurable. It's, it's, goodness is not a measurable thing to start with. It's a quality, not a quantity. Man, theologians are so dumb. Maybe they should have taken a course in basic laboratory or something. Oh, uh, let, let me measure out a pound of goodness. And God just has an infinite weight of goodness instead of pounds of it. No. It's a quality, a virtue, not a, not a measurable substance. It's not, a, it's not matter or energy. Am I being a bit mocking? Does Grider deserve to be mocked, even from the grave? I think so. The only point in this is to warn Nazarenes and others that might be tempted by this nonsense uh, with the penalty of the loss of their eternal salvation. So stay away from it. <clears throat> Surely, here, now here, you know, so he reverts to Calvinism. Every t in order to justify his false doctrine of the atonement, which is no doctrine of atonement at all, he attacks Calvinism, which is not related, necessarily related at all. Surely if God is, uh, were able to save some people sovereignly because his justice is satisfied by Christ's punishment, why does he not, if he is infinitely good, save everyone in a sovereign way? Because that wouldn't be infinitely good? To answer like a Calvinist, because God in his wisdom doesn't think it's wise to save everyone. <clears throat> for his glory. And even somebody that's not a Calvinist should understand that. It's like, is it, is it if, if, a, if a governor is truly good, why doesn't, he, why doesn't he pardon all the prisoners? Perhaps allowing all the murderers back on the street wouldn't be a good idea. Say, hell is God's penitentiary. <clears throat> and since repentance is a gift of God, there's no repentance in hell. Because you don't get grace from God in hell. You get justice from God in hell. From eternity, for eternity you will have God's justice. And you know it, and you won't be able to complain about it, because you know it's just. And perhaps it wouldn't be good to save everyone. I'm sure a Calvinist would successfully argue that. Or somebody else. He's equated. So first of all, it's it. If I were God and I had the power to sovereignly save everyone, I would. Well, since if you were Grider's God, you would not be by nature righteous. Now, see the the consequences of 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 Grider's false ideas about God, where love and righteousness aren't 
inherent, aren't inherently God's nature, not only those things being God's nature, just we don't have a word to, to describe, a single word that can describe the nature of God. Even what we do is impoverished. See, the problem is that if God is by nature righteous, he can't simply just overlook and forgive sin. The writer doesn't believe that. God just chooses to act righteously or chooses to act in a loving manner, as he'd put it. That's, not, that's a far different thing from saying that God is love. And when John said God is love, he didn't say God is exclusively love. Just like when the scripture talks about God is holy, doesn't mean he's only holy. He is also righteous, and God is love. He's justice, he's truth, he is life. Can't describe God in one word. God as he is and has always been and will always be because it's his nature. Unlike Grider who said, well, today God can love and tomorrow he might not. Well, how can you get away with that? Look at where the Nazarenes are today. All their churches here, practically all of them, have been Rick Warrenized. If you, if a church does, well, I remember the biggest ones, I know they did Rick Warren's 40 Days of Purpose because it was publicly available online. Warren had a database of churches that went through it. And so why would a Nazarene church even consider using that garbage that Rick Warren puts out. His purpose-driven thing. Really? That, that, that should be heresy to a Nazarene and everybody else. Because it is heresy. Where have I heard these arguments before? From atheists. That's where I've heard these arguments before. Uh, let's see here. Do I have the right audio level here? The problem is my audio goes up and down. Still another problem with that view is that it denies our free moral agency. Well, wait a minute. No, that's Calvinism. See, he's confusing these two, again, deliberately confusing these things. He obviously knows better. Either that or he's really dumb. Which, when, how, how do, can you be a professor of theology for 38 years and be so stupid? I, I just don't buy that. Now, being a politician for 38 years, yeah, I can buy that, being stupid. A professor of theology, has written papers, written books, subject to review. <sighs> How do you get away with this? He it denied the the substitutionary penal substitutionary atonement denies our free moral agencies. How so? See, there, there, there's a switcheroo going here. Bait and switch. Oh, I thought you were talking about the atonement, but you're really talking about Calvinism. Huh? This is dirty dog. This is a dirty dog trick. No, this is this is this is this is a 
Well, it's bait and switch. I mean, you, you say one thing, you're, you're talking about the atonement, and all of a sudden everything you're talking about is Calvinism. That's not re even related to the atonement. Even though Calvinists almost always believe in penal substitutionary atonement. But that's not related to limited atonement necessarily. That's a misunderstanding of the nature. What Christ died to satisfy. You know, a quantity of sins, that comes from Roman Catholicism. Rather than satisfy the law. And my view is Christ satisfied the law an innocent man died under the law, fulfilled the penalty of the law that he did not owe, so anyone that is in union with Christ, to use Calvin's words, I like that, union with Christ. Um, because I, I, I explain it like a marriage, traditional marriage. The husband's possessions and the wife's possessions become one. They're one new creature. And the scripture says we've been used the example of marriage and then said, and we have been, you know, like talking in Corinthians about fornication. And then he says, but we have been made one spirit with the Lord. The bride and the bridegroom. The bride, the bridegroom brings his assets, and the bride, in this case, brings her liabilities. He brings his death his sinless death, and she brings her sins that require death. Christ purchased his bride with his blood, his, his life. But it only actually covers those that are in union with Christ. Through faith, who have confessed him as Lord and believe in it, their heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. It's not quantitative. It doesn't matter how many people. Christ still has his innocent death and is in union with him. There's no salvation outside of Christ. That's why. That's why his dying on the cross doesn't save those that don't believe. It's not that it's not adequate. It's they're not joined together with him. It's only in that union. A further... Okay, it says, uh, it denies our free moral agency, stating that our decisions do not really count. He's talking about the predestination of all things. He's not talking about the atonement. Switcheroo. Uh, that they do not, that they, that they cannot really count. You're talking about election, not atonement. Election, individual election from eternity. You know, the, the God who had the eternal decree of all things. According to Calvinism. That has nothing to do with this. It nece doesn't necessarily fall. In fact, the eternal decree of all things sort of makes the cross like, it doesn't really fit, because salvation is by God's eternal decree, not by faith in Christ. Christ, you know, the cross is sort of, eh, doesn't really have a solid grounding in Calvinism. I think Lutheranism has more of a solid grounding there. And then, of course, you could look at predestination as all those who are in Christ are predestinated to be conformed to the image of God. All those who are in Christ, who believe in Christ, are predestinated to be justified and sanctified, and glorified. Things that God does, and God alone does. And since God is, is the one who calls, 
So, so, this is another example that might be useful. If it's helpful, if it's not, you might just say this old man's a fool. Consider a tradition, traditional uh, school dance. The young man, you know, there, there'll be bleachers there and all the, all the girls are there. And the young man, they go up and they, they ask their, the girl of their, you know, they pick a girl and say, will you dance with me? Now, she cannot get up, according to tradition, she can't get up and ask the boy to dance. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. The boy has to come and ask her. She can respond with a yes or a no. But she has to be asked before she can respond. Isn't that a little bit like what Christ does? God calls us. Paul talks about God's call. Consider your call, brethren. You cannot dance unless you've been asked. But you can refuse. It works for me. I mean, I've spent a lot of time pondering on this. It's like, how do you fit these things together? So you so you have election, you have choice. God's choice. God says, yeah, and calls you. And if he likes, says, empowers you to choose. And you can say yes or no. <laughs> and if you're really dis dissatisfied with your life and your sins, you will say yes. If the Holy Spirit has thoroughly convicted you of your sins, I think you'll say yes, having been there. So th this, is, this is silliness. It doesn't, God never says that our decisions don't matter. But his decisions matter more. And so what? If God were to choose somebody for salvation without regard to their choice, how is God be, would be unjust in that? He purchased you. You're his property. Christ died and bought you. Anyway, he bought all humanity out from under the curse of the law. Salva if, you, if you look in the Bible, judgment is based on what? On the law, the final judgment. On the law or whether or not you believe in Christ. Whether your name is in the Lamb's book of life. Is it based on how many sins you committed? Or whether or not you believed in Christ. Whether or not you were an adulterer or a murderer or a rapist or none of, the, of those? Will that make a difference in your judgment? Or whether or not you have believed in Christ? I hope you know the answer to that. Hmm. This might... How long a video can you make for YouTube? I don't know. Can I test? I don't know. I know the longer they get, the longer they take to process. Oh, I can let it run overnight processing. Well, some people do live feeds and they just leave the camera on 24 hours a day. For a free moral agency, where does the Bible talk about free moral agency? Where in the Bible? Try looking that up in the scriptures. Oh, okay, so you're, we're not talking about scripture here, are we? Any of this. We're just talking about arguments, man's arguments. Uh, <clears throat> a further problem with this view, so far these are all human objections, is that it is unfair to the non-elect. Unfair to the reprobates. Unfair to the sinners that reject Christ. No one who believes in Christ is rejected. Everyone who comes to Christ is received. Th this, this is such poor, unbiblical so-called theology that I'm incredulous, flabbergasted. Just like the nature of God is not love and righteousness, 
along with holiness and all the other attributes of God, properties we ascribe to God, because we don't have a word other than God to describe him as he is, What can you say? God saved the Nazarenes. How about that? God's, well, this man is no longer, th well, his book is still being used. I guess he still is. From, the very, from his grave, he will damn people. If they believe this, I'm sure this is still used at the well, this is still called the Olivet Univers uh, Nazarene Seminary or Nazarene College or whatever. It's no longer an Olivet. The Catholics bought that one. It's in north of here now. Unfair to the non-elect. So uh, what is fair? Isn't fair and just the same thing? I think so. So what do the non-elect, what, what do sinners that do not believe in Christ? Because that's what the non-elect are. <clears throat> What's fair for them to receive? God has a place. This is stupid. This is so stupid. The, the links people will go to to try to justify their silly positions. It's like watching YouTube. <laughs> it's like listening to Biden. It's like watching the the, the Europeans. We're going to get that evil Putin. We're going to freeze to death this winter to, to punish him. <sighs> By the way, I I I I I agree with Putin. <laughs> Just to see if YouTube will block this video. No, I think Putin did the right thing going into Ukraine. Because if, if you know what was about to happen and what had happened since 2014 with the American coup and what those people had been doing those years to the people in Donbass and why those people actually beat the Ukrainian army back in 2015 militarily, the, the militia of the Lugansk and the uh, Donetsk. And then there was an agreement, a peace agreement, called the Minsk Accords. And as soon as they could, Ukraine reneged on the agreement, along with Germany and France, who were supposed to be like co-signers. They had amassed an army of 120,000. They were about to go in and wipe out the the uh, the Donbas. They hated those people because they spoke Russian and they were Russians. That area has historically always been part of Russia. If you don't know history, you, if you knew history, you'd know the Ukraine was never really a thing anyway. It was a region. That's what it was. Uh, but Putin saved. Those people, they couldn't. He couldn't do otherwise. It forced his hand. Probably Americans were thinking that we can force him into this. We'll get him into another Afghanistan where we can bleed Russia again. Do not believe the American media or the or the. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, it, it's interesting. <clears throat> these little side of uh, here, the the gas pipelines that were blown up by. Well, I think we know who blew them up. The people that had uh, motive, opportunity, means, and had made prior threats. Just, you can figure it out. But, uh, yeah. We'll get back to this here. I just had to, maybe my mind was trying to find a place of sanity there compared to the insanity in this book. No, I, I think uh, Putin did what was right. And he's been very restrained. And uh, may God grant him the wisdom. He's a 
Orthodox Christian. May God grant him the wisdom to lead and to govern according to the grace of God and the will of God. Unlike certain American leaders, I can pray for them as God's will be done. <clears throat> the chief problem... Oh, wait a minute. If, if they go into eternal hell due to the sin of Adam, so it's unfair to the non-elect, for if they go into eternal hell due to the sin of Adam, <clears throat> and if unelected babies are included in this, who did not themselves disobey God in this life, it would seem to be quite unfair. Now, see, <clears throat> Grider includes babies and uh, imbeciles incompetence in people that are automatically saved. So I guess the best thing to happen is to, for you to be aborted or to be a, a, a an incompetent buffoon that doesn't know right from wrong. Somebody that, that's a moral vegetable. Because then you'll automatically be saved. Where does it say that in the Scripture? So the question is, where does it say it in the Scripture? Not whether you think it's right or wrong. Where does it say that in the Scripture? <coughs> where does God say... See, th this is based on free moral agency. See, these people don't have the free moral agency out of their own will and own power and own sovereign independence to choose God. Well, guess what? You don't either have that. This is, you know, this is Pelagianism. Even Wesley recognized that you had to have the prevenient grace of God to enable anybody to do anything, including to accept the gospel. The prevenient, that means what comes before. What comes before the gift of grace? Or God's grace that comes before salvation. In other words, that leads you to that, like the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Or the preaching of the gospel. Or the knowledge of the law, which reveals that you're a sinner. It's unfair to the non-elect. So, see, why would see that? Here's the inconsistency: If Grider does not believe that God is by nature just, who is he? Who is he to com complain about God being unjust when he doesn't believe that God is by nature just at all? I can't believe there weren't students. Aren't there theological students that, that will take on the professor? I remember running battles. Well, this was a secular school. Maybe in Christian schools, such things are verboten. But uh, I had a class in philosophical ethics, and it was a running war with the professor. Of course, we were approximately the same age. So. Oh, and a sociology class, too, like that. Hmm. I still got A's. I think, I think they appreciated a student that wasn't asleep and made them think, sometimes loudly, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sometimes I put on demonstrations in class to make my point. 
I don't think that would go over at a Nazarene school. How's a born again Christian? I'm not going to accept that garbage. I won't accept this garbage. You know, at, at one point when I was a pastor in Bismarck, I was uh, tempted. I, I looked into becoming a Nazarene pastor. And I looked into it and I said, no. <laughs> I'm too independent. It's like, no way. I'm not going to submit to your ideas and your rules and everything else. I'm not going to submit to what a, a district superintendent, a.k.a. bishop, in Chicago tells I have to get his permission to do anything. No. Show me in the Bible where I have to, have to kneel to the DS. Just. Oh, my. I guess I'm just a rebel with a cause, huh? This one of Christ's rebels. Yeah. So was Luther. So was Calvin. So was Zwingli. So was Menno Simons. I think all Christians are a rebel against this world and against corruption and against lies and nonsense. Okay, so apparently those who are not able to obey God or, or uh, who did not they them, themselves disobey God in this life. Okay, wait a minute. So um, the con apparently the concept of, of original sin doesn't matter here. But I would say original sin is the fact that you're devoid of the glory of God. You're devoid of the presence of God in your life. You're a temple without a purpose. You're an empty temple. And because of that, you're a self-centered temple. You, you live for yourself. A baby does the same thing. Besides, babies are covered by, if they have a believing parent, they're covered by their parent, their parent's relationship. So why would it be unjust? They're not innocent. They're fragments of Adam. They sinned with Adam. We've all sinned in Adam. We were there. We are all part of Adam. When Adam sinned, we were all present. We just hadn't been differentiated into the 8 billion people that we have today. Where, where, does our, where does our life come from? Where does our DNA come from? Where, where does our being come from? We're not independent creations. We all come from Adam, the sinner. We were there in the garden. Not consciously, but we were there in Adam. He was corporately, we, we were, he was the human race. All of it. I know it makes your head hurt. It makes my head hurt, too. But does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible talk about in Adam all have sinned? It doesn't matter. See, acts are just the fruit of sin. Are babies rebels against God? Of course they are. They're not innocent. They don't become sinners. They are conceived in sin. Because they're conceived in Adam. Obviously, Greider doesn't believe any of that either. Is this biblical or not? Search the scriptures. So it would seem to Greider quite unfair. The one who accuses God of not being righteous, just by nature just says, I, in my opinion, God would be quite unfair if he, if he did it this way. Uh. Well, is, there, is arrogance a sin? Is human... Ex this, this sounds a bit like Satan. I will ascend above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Why, some Calvinists I know would really love to 
pull this apart. So, see, Grider can't pause. I, I, I admit this is a, a tough concept because we think of ourselves as individuals. That's all we know. But a lot of other cultures have more of an identity uh, at, with the culture and their race, their, their nation, right? In the United States, we're individualists. We don't conceive of ourselves as primarily a member of a society just one part. So we seem to have problems with this. Don't conceive ourselves as, as one member of a people. United. We're, we're not. America's not a, a nation, an ethnos in the biblical sense. So we don't have no common genetic other than human bond, no blood bond, so to speak. Actually, we do, but it's not part of our, our psyche, our, our consciousness, our thinking. We divide up into little different groups because the politicians love it that way, divide and conquer. So that's... Uh, uh, Those who do not disobey God, oh, man. See, it's back to free moral agency and choice, uh, obedience and disobedience. It's not, this is not grace. There's no grace. Grider knows nothing of grace. And since all of humanity sinned in Adam and are sinners by nature, By nature, they're sinful. It's like a baby rattlesnake. It's still a rattlesnake. And even if it's not toxic enough necessarily to kill you then, it will grow up to become something that will kill you. Because its nature is that of a viper. And human beings, since the fall of Adam, are by nature rebels against God even if they haven't actively committed sin, they will, given the ability. We are not free moral agents. We have to be born again before we can even make a choice. Otherwise, we are slaves of sin. As Jesus said, all those who commit sin are slaves of sin. The bondage of sin. God, in fact, God has chosen to put all under sin that he might have mercy on all. Put us all in the same boat. Now, as far as imbeciles and the elderly, you know, the, God is able. Human beings are more than body and mind. They are spirit. And God is able to reach beyond our limitations. So before you accuse God of not giving them an opportunity... wait until you face him and you have adequate knowledge to judge God. He will vindicate himself. In fact, the cross is God's vindication. And again, children, if they have a believing parent, they're regarded as clean because of that parents faith which sort of uh, annuls the need for infant baptism but that's a different subject uh, <clears throat> the chief problem 
we're not going to get beyond the punishment theory, are we? The chief problem with the punishment theory of the atonement, he just, pejorative term, isn't that the punishment theory? I'm not pe using that word pejoratively, rather than the penal substitutionary atonement, which is the standard terminology. Now, Greider doesn't use that. Deliberately, you suppose? <clears throat> I'm sure he could pick up a book on Calvinist theology if he wanted to and use the Calvinist language, but he chooses not to. He chooses to use a pejorative, the punishment theory. Nobody likes to be punished, right? The chief problem with the punishment theory of the atonement, of course, is that it is unscriptural. Really? Really, that's unscriptural. For one thing, Scripture does not teach any predestination of eternal destiny at all, as discussed earlier, chapter 9, the doctrine of ourselves. So, in Greider's opinion, now, there's a lot of people that are much better educated uh, than Greider that would argue with that. And the scripture does talk about predestined. Romans chapter 9, chapter 8. He calls all those he has called, he predestines. Those he predestines, he also uh, uh, what is it? justifies. And those he justifies, he also uh, sanct is it, or sanctifies or glorifies. Is it sanctified and then glorified? Yeah, it's God's uh, what's called the golden chain of redemption. God does all these things. Salvation is of the Lord. It's God's work. The only reason you believe in Christ is because God called you and gave you the faith to believe. Now, does God have to do that with all guilty people? Does the governor, to be just, have to pardon everybody in the Maximus Curie prisons? Or is, or is his pardoning anybody really an exception to his justice? Mercy overriding justice. But since he, the writer doesn't believe that justice is an attribute at all of God, so nor is love, what kind of God does he worship or did worship? It is unscriptural also. Again, he's, he's conflating Calvinism and uh, the punishment doctrine. The punishment theory of the atonement. If Christ did not die in your place, and death is a punishment for sin, is the punishment for sin, ever since the garden, if you don't believe that he died in it suffered the punishment of death in your place, you're lost. You have not believed on Christ. That is the gospel. It is unscriptural also to teach that Christ did not die for everyone, but only for the elect. Again, this is conflating Calvinism with the penal substitutionary atonement, that he died to take our punishment in our place. Death is punishment for sin. Is it not? That's what the Bible teaches. When Scripture says he died for all, 2 Corinthians 5.15, it does not mean all the elect. Irrelevant. You can have universal atonement and still have the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. When you understand he died to satisfy the law, not to atone for a specific number of sins. See, the sins are, are simply the fruit of sinners. Sinners. 
really the substitutionary atonement is not related at all to predestination and Calvinism. It stands on its own because it is biblical. Oh, John Owen, he mentions John Owen's book. That's the death of death and the death of Christ, which is a polemic in favor of limited atonement. Which, again, as, as he correctly pointed out, Greider correctly pointed out, that Calvin, there's questions about whether Calvin held that doctrine. It's, there's nowhere he stated that. Uh, so... The principal reason why the punishment theory is unscriptural is because its basic claim is unscriptural, which is that Christ was punished on our behalf instead of us. Is that an outright denial of the cross or not? It is. Scripture never says that he was punished for us or that he paid the penalty for us. Really? Well, since he challenges that, let's just look at a very common scripture. Okay, let's see. Go here. Oops, I didn't want that button. <clears throat> I need to do this button. Okay, <clears throat> Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, previously in Romans, Paul says what? The wages of sin is what? Death. <coughs> Death is a punishment for sin. It is the punishment for sin. God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ, not, while after, not when we were totally sanctified, but while we were still sinners, the human race, Christ died for us on our behalf. Let me demonstrate that. See if I got this right. Yeah, it makes... Make a statement about the Greek and then realize I'm not looking at the right verse. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Christ who per. Who per. Christos who per nuon apethanan. Christ on our behalf. Huper Noon died. Christ on our behalf for us died. On our behalf, in our place. Substitutionary atonement. He substituted his death for ours. Oh, Scripture doesn't say anything about this. It says it's all through the New Testament. Much more than having been justified by his blood, his death. He is right that uh, the blood and his death are the same thing. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Not just the wrath of God, the wrath of the law, the punishment of the law. If then, uh, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's continue a little bit. But not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We've been reconciled 
to God through Christ, through his death, for our sin. What does reconciliation mean? How are we reconciled? What's the barrier between God and man? Our sin. Our violations of his law. The law had to be satisfied. Our sin had to be atoned for. We had to it had to be paid for. The law doesn't say, well, uh, unless, uh, uh, unless you decide to forgive them. <laughs> no. It doesn't have exceptions. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. There is no one who has not sinned because we were there in Adam. He is not simply the representative of the human race. He was the human race. We are all derivative. We are all fragments of Adam. We have his life and his DNA. Our natural life, everything that we're born with, comes from Adam. Because all sinned. It doesn't say all will sin, it said all sinned. Do you believe that? I do. For until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. See, if God didn't want people to be sinners, he could have not given a law. Then no one would have ever sinned. Because there's no commandments to break. <sighs> Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned. Why do babies die if they have never sinned? Even over those who have not sinned uh, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of he who was was to come, that is Christ. God shut up all under sin that he might have mercy on all doesn't mean save all. And he offered salvation to all. Christ is there. Whoever is willing to, as Paul says, he's not far from any of us. Problem is we don't want him. Okay. This is getting pretty long. I don't think we'll get on to the uh, Grider's form of the atonement, the governmental, the Grotius theory. So, so Grider refuses to believe that Christ was punished, that Christ was nailed to the cross, that Christ died a death that he didn't owe. So why did he die on the cross? What was the point? Just to make a, a spectacle that somehow says that God takes sin seriously? See, only the substitutionary atonement makes sense biblically. Only that makes the cross important. Everything else devalues the cross from its biblical perspective, from where its place is in the Bible, that I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. But it does explain why I haven't heard the gospel, to my recollection, any real presentation of the gospel at a Nazarene church in the last year. Because it's not really central. Heard a lot about the Spirit. 
and the Spirit ministering to us. I heard a lot about prayers for people to get well. And but I can't remember hearing hardly anything about Christ and him crucified for our sins. Well, if Nazarenes don't believe in that, why am I going there? I've got to figure this out. Well, obviously, if Nazarenes don't go th believe in the, the Christ and him crucified, in the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ, it's not a Christian church, and I'm in the wrong place. Might as well go with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Not. <laughs> or the Mormons. No. Because you don't have a Savior. What kind of a Savior you got? He saved you from what? I mean, if you can be sinlessly perfect, you don't really need the cross, do you? So it's unscriptural, according to Greider, uh, which is that Christ is punished on our behalf uh, or instead of us. Scripture never states that he was punished for us or that he paid the penalty for us. He died on our behalf, you moron! You spiritual moron! He died on our behalf! What did I just read? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who pair on our behalf? That's what who pair means. In our place, in our on our behalf. It's like somebody that you can't pay your bill. You can't pay your 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 uh, your rent. And somebody comes there and pays your rent on your behalf. In this case, you had a death sentence hanging over you. And Christ paid that on your behalf. He died on your behalf. If Grider, if a Christian doesn't believe that, he is not a Christian. It's that serious. It is that serious. I guess I really don't have to get to the substitutionary atonement because it's sort of working itself in, isn't it? I mean, this is the biggest deal in Christianity. What did Christ do on the cross? And anybody that depreciates that, well, they get the boot, the boot of disfellowship. Which, like I said, if, if the pastor at that church holds to Grider's view, we've got no fellowship. No fellowship at all. We've got nothing to talk about. Except he needs to repent of his unbelief. Because there's nothing, we have nothing in common. We don't have the Lord Jesus in common. Scripture never states that he was punished for us. What does it say? He died for us. Death isn't punishment for sin? How stupid can you be theologically? Apparently you can be a professor of theology for many years in a Nazarene university or Nazarene seminary and not believe that Christ died for us as took our punishment, the punishment of death. You don't believe death is a punishment for sin? Yikes, something's wrong here. Or that he paid the penalty for us. Yes, the penalty was death. Christ always states and said that he suffered for us. No, it doesn't. That is a lie. It doesn't say he suffered for us. It says Christ died for us. Yes, it does talk about him suffering for us. He suffered what? Death. 
suffered death, which is the punishment for sin. A child can understand it. Well, as Jesus said, you, God has chosen to reveal these secrets to, to these little ones, whereas the, the erudite, the educated, he's hidden the gospel from them. Just things haven't changed, have they? Oh, my. We're at two hours. Well, one thing nice about YouTube videos, they're not live. You can always go back and you know, break it up into sections. Take it a bite at a time. I think this is actually worth listening to. I think Christians... Because you seldom hear about Christ and the cross, anyway. But this is this is central, central. If you don't have this right, you don't have Christ. What are you believing in Christ for? To give you your best life now? You don't hear this from Joel Osteen, do you? He doesn't care if you go to hell as long as you send him your money. He doesn't know the gospel. He's ignorant. Or he went to Nazarene Seminary. No, he didn't go to seminary at all. He was in charge of his father's uh, television production. His father died. Uh, the scripture always states, not true, th th instead that he suffered for us. See, this is a lie. Not true at all. We just saw he died for us. He suffered death for us. But see, you know, the Nazarene handbook says that Christ suffered for us. I, so there, you know, that, uh, okay, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? So death is not a punishment for sin? Huh? What did he do on the cross? He died. He suffered and was and died. He was buried. The wages of sin is what? Death. We earned death. Christ paid our bill. Thus Paul says the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives. What the heck translation is that? Might be the NIV. 2 Corinthians 1 5. I hate the NIV. 2 Corinthians 1 5. What? The sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives? <laughs> Maybe somebody knows the NIV better than I do. But this is just weird. No, it doesn't say that either. I have no idea what translation he's using. He's not using the NLT, which is popular with, with the, the in crowd of the Rick Warrenite, uh, uh, the, the community, the, the purpose-driven, seeker-sensitive New Nazarenes. The skinny jeans and the raggedy pants on the women and the the the, the uh, conference room slash theater church stuff with contemporary music, <laughs> very contemporary, the latest. <sighs> well, it's not the uh, the Young's Literal. It's not the NLT. It's not the NIV. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ. So also, uh, our comfort abounds through Christ. Uh, for just as, that's, he doesn't put a, a translation on it, version on it. So just the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. So also, our comfort is abundant through Christ. No, none of them. King James, no. New King James, no.
Am I looking to the right verse? Yes. So, just so Christ also suffered... Um, the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives. I have no idea what dang uh, translation that is. It might be good news for modern man or Phillips or some old paraphrase. He doesn't specify. Boy, that's weird. No, that's not what it says. <clears throat> what does it say? For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, Okay, that that's uh, into us, or possibly for us. Well, this just says Christ died for us. That's you know, it's you can't take a verse, you can't use a verse out of context like this. You have to look. You can look at a verse where it's clearly taught. Christ died for us on our behalf. Okay, uh, that's talking about the, Christ's sufferings for our sins. Uh, even so, Christ doth abound to our our comfort, our our, our comfort, our, to be strengthened by Him. Confortus, uh, He strengthens us, uh, uh, will comfort us. The, the context here, always look at the context when you get something weird. Uh, always look at the context. Is He talking about the atonement here? In fact. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we are comforted by God. In other words, the grace we experience by God when we suffer, we're able to share with other people that might be going through the same thing. Yeah. Because we can say, I've been through this, and I can tell you, God is there. And if you hold to him, he will bring you through. Because he did for me. This is not about the atonement. For as the sufferings of Christ are abound in us, so our consolation also abounds in Christ. This is not about the atonement. This is about the sufferings we endure in life, just as the sufferings Christ endured in life. See, when a person uses a verse out of context, they're a deceiver. They are not rightly handling God's word, or as King James says, rightly dividing, which isn't about dividing anyway. It's about handling accurately. So does the scripture always say what he claims it says? No. He's, he's either a deceiver or he's utterly ignorant of the scriptures. Which is more likely? I think he's got an axe to grind, which is why he always tries to conflate penal substitutionary atonement, which is the gospel, with Calvinism, which is not the gospel. In Hebrews we read, And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people holy through his own blood. What kind of suffering did he do on Mount Calvary, on Golgotha? He was crucified and died. He didn't just suffer. He suffered what? the punishment of sin, even though he was not a sinner. What kind of fast one is Grider trying to pull? Can, he can't be that ignorant. He's, is he trying to deliberately deceive his students? 
Or is he just given over to a reprobate mind because he doesn't he rejects the gospel? I don't know. This this is really hard to believe. Oh, I don't think that's a Jesus also suffered outside the gate of the city to make the people holy through his own blood. Remember, this is a holiness movement. It's about being made holy. It's about having holiness imparted to you. Not imputed, imparted. Now let's take a look at that verse. Always, look, How do the people handle the scriptures? Always look at how careful they are with handling the scriptures. Now, Christians, we are called to judge those in the church, especially people that are trying to teach you something. If they're trying to mislead you on the atonement, well... That comes under the category of an anathema, I think. Look at Galatians. Simply adding a commandment, one commandment, to grace. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Adding one commandment brings you under the curse of God, the anathema. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Of course, he's writing to the Jewish audience here, to Jewish believers. He's, a, he's, he's therefore also, so, okay, this is in the subject of Moses and the law. It says, we, go back up to verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle, the temple, have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Died! A sacrifice must die! And shed his blood. He said, why did Jesus die outside the gate? Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp. See, the argument in Hebrews, he says, don't go back to the law. There's nothing there for you. They were being pressured to return to the law of Moses. And the writer of Hebrews is arguing strongly that if you do that, Christ will be of no value to you at all. You've cut yourself off from Christ. There is no salvation there. There's no salvation in the law. Salvation is only in the new covenant in Christ. The law could not ever actually forgive sin. So his argument is... You know, so we get we're 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 exiles, we're strangers and exiles, we're 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 kicked out of Jerusalem. We're pushed out. Now remember the early church, Paul was taking up offerings for them. Why? Because they were dispossessed by their people, by their families, by the synagogues, because they believed in Christ. And they were being pressured to go back. That's what the context of Hebrews is all about. Therefore, to sanctify the people, yeah, what? God's own people, those who trust in Christ. Set them apart to himself. That's what the word sanctify means. It means make you God's possession. It doesn't make you sinless. That's not the purpose. That's not what the word sanctify means separate you unto God. That's what it means. 
<clears throat> that's what holy is. It's something that belongs to God. It's why we can be holy even though we sin. Because we belong to God. And he's purified us with his blood. <coughs> Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp. Again, uh, uh, because he's talking to the Jewish audience, referring back to, to Moses in the wilderness. Bearing his reproach. In other words, uh, we have our, our our part in his death, in his uh, in his suffering too, because we are joined to him. Bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This is not about the atonement. Now, the atonement is discussed in Hebrews. If you want to know what God says about the atonement, you go to the scripture, preferably in the epistles, where the atonement is spoken of and taught about. There's lots of that in Hebrews, not here. Not in these verses. In Luke we read, didn't see he just because it uses the word suffer. This is not how you do scripture. You don't look up every verse that uses the word suffer. You use verses in their context. And what did he suffer? Death. He also suffered reproaches. That's what is being used in here. But the death, his blood, he sanctified his people with his own blood, set them apart to him, purchased them with his blood. That's death. In Luke we read, did not the Christ? Now, I have no idea, like here, in this verse that we just looked at. Let me go to 12 and see if I can look at different versions here. Make the people holy through his, yeah, this is the NIV. Now, Greider was, even though he complains about the NIV being a Calvinist translation, he was also one of the translators of the NIV, which does not really bear much witness to his credibility. The NIV is awful. I, there are worse translations like the NLT and Good News for Modern Man and... Those are all paraphrases. NIV is a paraphrase. It's not a really loose paraphrase, but it's a paraphrase. Hmm. He uses whatever translation fits what he wants to say best, just like Rick Warren. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and enter his glory? Uh, 2436, Luke 24. Now, does that talk about his death? See, he's simply using the word suffer and trying to prove that it's not about Christ being punished, but simply Christ's suffering. He's bamboozling people that don't actually look up the verse. He's trusting you to be lazy. <clears throat> so this is when Christ appeared and he said... Uh, uh, <clears throat> And so they rose up the very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, now this is the people he appeared to on the road to, uh, to uh, let's see, where was it? doesn't matter. It's on the tip of my tongue.
Emmaus, <clears throat> yeah. And the verse that he was looking at was, if a people, if a person doesn't handle the Bible accurately, disregard them. Twenty-four thirty-six. So they were saying that the witnesses that he appeared to said, uh, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And and they, uh, this is not Simon Peter, I don't think. And they told him the things that had happened on the road. No, it's not Simon Peter. And how he uh, was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst. Is this right? Oh, no, 24, I'm getting ahead, 24, 26. Uh, Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones! And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Suffered what? Died on the cross. For what purpose? What purpose? To, to atone for what? The punishment of the law. The wages of sin is death. The curse of the law. He fulfilled the law. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Did not he say that? Was his death not a fulfillment of the law for us? Was not his obedience a fulfillment of the law for us? All right. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to maybe cut this short. Let's see if there's anything specific. Uh, no, we're almost there. Uh, one more paragraph. And as John Milley says in The Atonement of Christ, that's, uh, suffering is significantly different from punishment. Why? You can suffer punishment, can you not? This is stupid. He's arguing for he's arguing against Christ dying pain our penalty. He hates the idea of Christ dying for us on our behalf. It's all I can take from this. He's grasping at straws. So what does Millie say? Now, Millie is not a Calvinist or necessarily an Orthodox Christian. Um, <clears throat> all punishment is suffering, but not all suffering is punishment. Christ's suffering was punishment. Christ did not suffer for himself. He suffered for us. What is wrong with this man? The difference between the two is punishment presupposes guilt. And suffering does not. Since Christ was sinless, he was guiltless. Christ was not punished on his own behalf, you net. Wet. What is wrong with these people? They just can't abide this doctrine. He suffered but was not punished. No, the whole purpose was to pay for us, our sin, to suffer and die on our behalf. Greider is not a Christian. Greider is a heretic. And if this what na is what Nazarenes in general believe, then they are heretics too outside the atonement of Christ? That's the question. 
Where are there any Nazarenes out there that want to answer this? Biblically. Is it I have I, my question is and my concern is is this what Nazarenes are taught? That Christ did not die our death, the death we owed to the law. That he was not punished in our place, voluntarily. He submitted himself as the Lamb of God. What does a lamb do? Why is a lamb executed, put to death? For itself or for the sins of others? To atone for the sins of others. Is there no concept of the of an atonement? What was a lamb dying for its own sin or the sins of people? In the Old Testament. For the sins of God's people. This is profoundly ignorant. You might as well be a liberal and deny the resurrection. Because it didn't make any difference anyway to you. Since Christ is sinless, he is guiltless. But his our sins were imputed to him. Just like the high priest laid his hands on the the head of the sacrifice and laid the sins of the people on that animal. The animal was not guilty of them, but the animal died and shed his blood. What, what was the purpose of God ordaining that? As a picture of the coming Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Profound ignorance. When he died for us, therefore, he suffered but was not punished. And since there was a substitution of his suffering for the punishment that believers otherwise would have received in hell, the Father can actually forgive us. Punishment would be clearly satisfied, would have, punishment would have clearly satisfied God's justice. Yes! That's the whole point! That God's justice was satisfied on the cross. That he might be both justified in his mercy and grace, and be the justifier of sinners. Punishment would have clearly satisfied God's justice, but Grider does not believe that. It would have. That's what God did. But since Christ suffered instead of being punished, what did he suffer? What did he suffer? Death. And death is a punishment. Is it not? This man's got a weird mind. Or had a weird mind. <clears throat> But Christ suffered instead of being punished that the Father might forgive those who repent and believe. Now, let me point out that I think with, with commonly, when it comes to, I could look up Greider, what Greider says about it here, but I don't have time since we're past two hours, two and a half hours, uh, that Nazarenes typically believe, like some others, that repentance involves putting away all your sins and then belief. No, repentance is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. Salvation is what God has done for us and what he does in us, too. All the way 
from predestination to glorification. Because that's what the Scripture says in Romans. Those whom he did predestinate, he also called. And all those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also... I think he just goes right on to glorify, glorify there, but there's sanctified in between. God does all those things. They're all his work. You can't do any of those things. Salvation is of the Lord, as it said in the prophets. And where does your free agency come in? Well, God doesn't depend on your free agency. He depends on him. He's God. His free agency. Your salvation depends on God, not on you. On God's grace, God's mercy, God's atonement for your sin, God's gift of repentance and faith, God calling you. And all those he's called, he also is predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. But that doesn't happen until Christ returns. If you look up the proof text for total sanctification or entire sanctification, you'll find out it occurs at the coming of the Lord. If you actually read the entire verse. Verses. Well, that's... Uh, I can... I, I'm running out of steam here, so I'm going to have to bring this video to an end. But we've gone through uh, the Grider's uh, reasoning on why the substitutionary atonement of Christ is not valid. Well, I would say Grider is not valid. But... Uh, you can judge for yourself. Search the scripture. Would you rather trust in Christ dying on behalf of you uh, for your sins? Or you want a Christ that just suffers? In one case, he paid the penalty. In the other case, he did not. Because the wages of sin is death, not suffering. See, that's a Catholic idea that you can suffer and atone for your own sins. It takes more than that. It takes your sins to be atoned for completely by a perfect substitute. Because you can never atone for anything. Because you're not sinless. And if you think you are, you're grossly deceived. Well, I hope that helps someone. If it helps just one, it's worth it. <sighs> Dig into the cross. Search out what God really did for you there. Don't be satisfied with anything less than what the Scripture says about the cross. Why was Paul... Why did Paul determine when he came to Corinth to know nothing among them except Christ and Christ crucified.